Shut up. He slid his hands upwards to cup Edgar's face, forcing him to make eye contact. Before, Edgar had been able to see a screw bin behind Johnny's eyes. He hadn't bothered to truly hide himself, but now he couldn't see him anywhere. There was just that same haunted, wide-eyed look Johnny so often had, asking for something from him he didn't know how to give. Then, that look in his eyes changed to the soft reverence Edgar had seen in the movie theatre. Simple and painfully human, so normal and understandable, enraptured by something harmless, truly invested in a work of art. The one that had punched a huge hole into his method and beliefs around Johnny, had forced him to reconsider. Oh, Edgar. Oh God, no, not the voice again, not the voice. Oh God, please no. Edgar, you're the kindest person I've ever met. With perfect sincerity, as Scriven gently ran his hand across Edgar's face, a thin fingertip brushing across the scar beneath Edgar's eyes. It was almost enough to make him scream. The sound of his voice, the body, his face, everything. It was like his dreams. It was like a dream. Fear. His body was flooded with fear. Nothing but fear. His thought processes sped, desperately forming escape plan after escape plan, and then abandoning them before they got past the halfway point. His entire body shuddered and he could feel his stomach clenching along with most of his muscles, all desperately trying to escape with just as much success as before. I admire you, and you give me strength. God, stop it, stop it. Shut up. Edgar managed to find his voice, although it was shaky and ragged. Again, with the voice came movement, and he struggled anew to try and turn his face away from Johnny, Scriabin, to no avail. His hands held him too tightly. The bones dug into him and forced him to stare at him, forced him to look at this living lie forced him to look at. I won't. I won't. This is a lie. It has to be a lie because he would never say that. He can't say that. This can't be real. Edgar couldn't look away. Screaming's expression was sincere and contrite. He mimicked Johnny's voice so perfectly, so painfully. He looked at Edgar with adoration that was so wrong. Stop it. Stop it. Edgar screamed as if there was anyone present that could help him. Scriabin moved closer to him and ran one of his hands up into Edgar's hair. His entire scalp tingled at the contact. His face burned horribly like his scars were bleeding again. The ropes around his chest only tightened as he felt like he was breaking apart. He was losing feeling to his legs, losing feeling to everything. You can handle this. This is all a dream. It isn't happening. You can handle this, Edgar. You've done it before. You can do it again. Just calm down. You just have to calm down and... Detach. I need you. Scriven looked to Edgar and he sounded so sincere. He sounded so sincere that Edgar wanted to punch him in the face. Just shut up! Nothing he said made a difference. Nothing he said did anything. It was as if Scriven were replaying a memory, replaying a fantasy or a dream with pre-planned lines and roles. He ran his hand through Edgar's hair ran the other along the edge of his shirt. He caressed his neck with such care that it was impossible. This wasn't Scriabin as he knew him. This wasn't anything. It wasn't anything real. How could someone who hated him so much be so careful, put on such a perfect show of adoration? You're such a good person. Such love and devotion. He couldn't detach. He was trying, and he couldn't. He could feel every movement that Scriabin was making, each shift of his fingers across his skin. He could feel the trails that he left as he traced his way up Edgar's face, running a soft finger across his scars. It was so gentle that it made his entire face twitch. The thorns in his speech were softening to the special tone that Edgar had only heard Johnny use with him. That tone that was reserved for him. That softer, 
gentler tone because Johnny accepted him as equal. What if Johnny's trying to make you Debbie? What if Johnny loves you, Edgar? What if Johnny loves you, Edgar? What if, Edgar? What if? I would never hurt you. And even the sense of regret that came through his words, that promise that Johnny would not hurt him again, that sick, twisted sense of sorrow that he could hear whenever Johnny tried to apologize but couldn't because his pride or dementia prevented him. And now there was nothing. There was nothing preventing what he had always hoped he would say. What he had never hoped he would say. What he would never say. Pure wrong escaping from Johnny's lips. He could not detach. He was trying. All he could do was repeat one word to himself over and over and over again. No, 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 no. Screeben's nails scraped against Edgar's scalp. His other hand edged beneath the collar of his shirt. His face was getting closer. Close enough so that when he spoke, Edgar could feel his breath. Close enough that Edgar felt the urge to close his eyes and he could not say why. He could not stop shaking. His face burned so much that he was sure that Screeben could feel the heat emanating from his skin. He could feel something making its way down his face, leaving twin cooling trails. Oh God, please stop, please stop. I don't want to hear this. I don't want to do this or feel this or see this or hear this or feel this. I don't want this. Please stop, please stop. I'm begging you, I'm begging you, please stop. I'll do anything. Just don't do this to me anymore. Just stop doing this. You fixed me, Edgar. Johnny, Scriabin said softly. Edgar tried to move his arms, but they refused to listen. Tried to do something, but there was nothing he could do. I want you to fix me. I want you to fix me. I think you can fix me. You're not like the others. You're not like the others. I've grown somewhat fond of you. I like you. Thank you. Thank you. You're not like the others. I want you to fix me. I want you to fix me. You'll be beautiful. You'll be beautiful just like the others. You'll understand. You always understand me. I want to spend the rest of my life with you. I don't hear the voices when I'm They're here. too far away. I don't hear things now. I don't hear things when I'm here. I don't hear things. It's safe here. It's safe here. I can feel safe here. I can think here. Your house is quiet. It's very quiet. I want you to fix me. I think you can fix me. I trust you. I trust you to fix me. I trust you to fix me. I love you so much, Edgar. I'm going to kill you, Edgar. I'm going to kill you, Edgar. No, Edgar whimpered. Please. With the slowness of someone who knows their prey can't escape, Scriabin closed in. And just as he expected, Edgar did not move. He did not even try to resist. He had tried everything in his mental arsenal to defend himself. Everything had failed. Everything. Now he was defenseless, bound in leather straps and ropes of his own creation, without even the motivation to move. He did not try to resist because at this point, he found that resistance was futile. He could not resist. A pervasive web of probability that couldn't be brushed aside. The fingers in his hair clenched tightly, causing sharp pain that Edgar barely registered. The hand creeping under the edge of his shirt now took hold of his shoulders, dragging him forward. Why not? Johnny was forceful and direct in everything he did. Why not this? He was present when Scriabin kissed him. He was there and he did not even try to pretend it wasn't happening. He didn't try to rationalise it, understand what it meant, explain it away. He didn't try to ignore the sharp pain from his tense grip, the pressure on his shoulder. 
He didn't ignore the sensation of Screeben forcing his lips open and did not even try to stop him. There was no point. There was no point anymore. He could not deny anything anymore. He could not stop him. He had no power. No power. He had never had power in his relationship with him. Why now? Teeth closed on his lip with sickening confidence, and he tasted pennies. Even in the face of sudden sharp pain, the sudden stabbing hurt accompanied by the uncomfortable sensation of loose skin hanging from the inside of his wounded lip, he could not muster the energy to react. His jaw remained slack and, discounting the initial instinctive jerk, he did not move. His tongue stayed still, even as it was felt by Johnny's. Even as the growing blood began to swell around his taste buds, which did not improve his nausea, the pain dulled to a throbbing ache. Still, he did not move. Johnny did not notice. After all, it wasn't as if Johnny was trying to get Edgar to participate in the kiss. He knew better. Edgar had always been passive. Everything he had ever done was passive. He could not rationalize this away, make the copper fade. Every thought and reminder that this was merely a dream that Screeben was controlling, mere thought manipulation was gone. Constricting strings of touch and voice. He was going to accept this. He had already accepted this. His entire life was acceptance. I'm not scared of death. A heaven for me, and a hell for you. I have nothing to fear. And he was right. This wasn't fear. Not right now. When Screeben broke away, the adoring look was gone. Instead, he looked disappointed and disgusted. Normal. He ran a hand across his lips, a faint trail of pink marking a skeletal hand. He stared at Edgar as if he had failed some test. And he had failed. Edgar desperately tried to reconcile what had happened, tried to piece everything back together into some kind of logical whole that was anything except what had just happened. But it all kept crashing down on him. Crashing down. That would have been what it would have felt like. Screeben had imitated Johnny perfectly, even how Johnny would go about biting Edgar if he decided to do so. That would have been what it would feel like. They were so in love, and I loved them so much. And now I can look back on them, and they're still so beautiful. Someday, when I look back on Edgar, it will be just as beautiful. No. No, I don't hate you. It's not supposed to be a bad thing. I like you, you know. You don't want me to hate you? God, no. No, 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 no. Nee, I wouldn't hate you. I don't hate you now. Listen to me. I am going to hurt you. And when the time comes, I am going to kill you. I want to fix you. I want you dead. Don't you get it? Don't you understand? That's all I have left. I wish I knew something. <coughs> Anything. I devoted precious time to it. <coughs> I'd rather not die. Edgar. God. The first word that Edgar could finally say. Tightening. He couldn't breathe. God, I... I... 
if a man also lie with mankind as he lieth with a woman. I, both of them, have committed an abomination. I can't. They should surely be put to death. I, a heaven for me and a hell for you. A heaven for me and a hell for you. Heaven for me, hell for you. Heaven for me, hell for you. Heaven. He shut his eyes. He couldn't. It was the last thing he had left. It was the only thing he had left. I can't. I can't. So, so much. It hurts. And it loosened. The ropes. The wires. The straps. Everything that had wrapped around him began to dissolve, began to fade away and fall to strips, fall apart. And he slowly fell to the white, slowly and without emotion. Scriabin knelt in front of him and stared at the remnants of empty wings. And it all comes tumbling down. I can't. I can't. It's my life. It's all I have. It's my life. It's mine. I can't let it be taken away. I can't let myself do this. I can't let myself... I, I can't let Scriabin do this to me. I can't let him take away the one thing that gives my life meaning. I can't let him do this. I won't let him do this. I'm so broken. I'm broken. I want someone to turn me off and fix me. I want to fix you. I can't let myself do this. I can't do this. I can't. I won't. I can't. Edgar felt deeply sick, and he drew his knees up close to his chest to huddle into a miserable ball, staring into space as he tried to get himself under control. I am under control. The copper taste was fading. The annoying sensation of loose skin remained. Weep and wail, sob and shiver. It's okay, my boy. A smile. After all, there's no one here but us. There's no need to hide your feelings. No need to conform to that standard of the emotionally withdrawn male. In fact, there is no way to hide your feelings, considering. So feel free to burst into tears at any time. Edgar ignored him. This didn't seem to bother Scriabin too much. He reached down and picked up a scrap of a white rope, studying it as he spoke. He sounded bored, even as he smashed through any of Edgar's desperate attempts to rebuild. You really do love this Johnny boy. Or at least, what you wish he was. No, I don't. That's not true. Anger. Scriabin let the piece of rope fall. Here I am, Edgar. Here's what you wish Johnny was and what Johnny's trying to be. And you're having a nervous breakdown. It's pathetic. That's not what I want. This isn't what I want. This isn't what he wants. You're not Johnny. It was not often that he sounded so surprised. Excuse me? Edgar stared at Scriabin, trying to see behind those ringed and tired eyes to see his true form. His voice was even and emotionless, talking with no expression. You're framing my reaction as though I'm being unreasonable, as though I asked you for something and then changed my mind without warning, as though I didn't want you to stop every step of the way. Can't you hear my thoughts? He shut his eyes, his breath coming in thin. Didn't you hear what I was thinking? I asked you to stop. I begged you to stop. And you didn't, and that's my fault. Edgar took in a shaking breath, trying to calm his heart. And Johnny, Scriabin, sat and stared at him, silent. Adrenaline left him feeling cold, made his chest hurt. 
I didn't want this. You know I didn't. You're not what I want. You're not what I wish Johnny was. You can't make me want this. You forced this on me and now you're blaming me for it. You're blaming me for not wanting it and you can't do that. That's not fair. It's not true. And something occurred to him. Something that made his heart stumble a little at the connection. Just because you believe that's who I am, that that's what I want, doesn't make it true. It doesn't change what things actually are. His head ached. His breathing wasn't steady, and Edgar pressed a trembling hand to his forehead. It took Screeb in a few moments to either process what Edgar had said, or formulate a response. Now wait a minute. Screeb put a thin hand on Johnny's chest. Are you saying that I invented this so-called false version of you? That every pathetic little concession you made to him in service of the suicidal joke of a relationship was actually my doing? That I manipulated your mouth and used your marvelous powers of ventriloquism to make you say you loved Johnny? I didn't say that. I'd never say that. You know what you did. Edgar rubbed at his lips with intentional disgust. The back of his hand came back clean. Screeben took on an air of offended dignity that sounded almost in character for Johnny, which gave Edgar another surge of nausea. Oh, that's right. This was all my doing. I created this body, this voice, your masochism. I made those straps in your tears and your confession. I made you do everything. It's all my fault. For God's sake, Edgar, do you ever take responsibility for yourself? Your actions? You can't foist your teary, harlequin romance novel confession of your undying love for an emotionally crippled serial killer on me. Edgar adjusted his glasses. I didn't say that. I didn't say that. Go back to normal, Scriabin. Scriabin just rolled his eyes. Fine. Whatever. And in the blink of an eye, Scriabin was back to his original form. Despite the fact that seeing this living version of his toy made Edgar feel sick, it was better than the alternative. Feel better? He had to calm down. He had to regain and retain control of himself. That was who he was. That was what he did. He stared past Scriabin, through him, so he could take in several deep breaths and slow his heart and at least attempt to calm his stomach a little. When he spoke, it was his usual calm and quiet tone, which satisfied him. Scriabin, I've had enough. I'm not going to let you manipulate me anymore. The lengths you went to to try and force me to fit the narrative you've made for me are ridiculous. You're clearly desperate, but I'm not going to be responsible for beliefs you hold about me that aren't true. I'm not going to let you make me feel responsible for them. As Edgar got to his feet, Scriabin tilted his head to follow him. Trying to blame this on me again, he said. I'm afraid I'm not the one at fault here. Yes, you are. Edgar looked down at Scriabin. You've said it more times than I can count. There was a moment of silence before Edgar held out his hand to him. Screeben stared at it. You are me. There was another moment of silence. Screeben slowly reached out and took Edgar's hand, and Edgar pulled to try and raise him to his feet. You say that I'm a masochist, in love with a demon who's bent on my destruction. You talk about me absolving responsibility for my actions, for my relationship, about trapping myself in lies, devoting myself to falsehoods, a downward spiral of learned helplessness leading to my inevitable destruction. As Scriabin opened his mouth to make some kind of comment, Edgar cut him off. Scriabin, you've told me countless times that I am you, that you are me, that we're the same person. And you're so insistent about it that one could almost believe you mean it. 
Except that we're only the same person when it's convenient for you. Whenever I do something you think is wrong, suddenly there's nothing you want less. It's not our fault I forgot a book. It's mine. It's not our fault I act stupidly. It's mine. It's not our fault that we're trapped in this mess. It's mine. We're not in love with... Scraven made a very strange noise at this point, which stopped Edgar for a few precious seconds but he recovered before Scraben could break into the conversation. We're not in love with Johnny, Edgar repeated. This time, Scraben kept silent, although he was tense. I am. We're not masochistic. I am. Do you see my point? For all your talk about how you're me, about how I created you, about how you're a part of me. You certainly don't want to take responsibility for my, or rather, our faults. So am I responsible? Or are you? Scriabin stared up at him for a few minutes in silence. Then, with deep sarcasm and hatred, said, I'm you. Scriabin yanked Edgar's arm down so sharply that Edgar almost toppled over. He hissed in his face with furious spite. You listen to me. I am not you. I'm not this you, anyway. I'm not a pathetic, needy shell of a man who is prone to self-destruction as a method of validating my existence. I recognize and avoid danger. I am what you should be. I am what you were. When you got your frontal lobotomy courtesy knee, I am what you lost. No, you're not. Edgar pulled his arm back hard, this time dragging Scriabin up with him. The two stood and stared at each other. Scriabin smiled in that awful way, his voice pure hate. Oh, that's right. I'm not. I must have been confused. You're lying to me. You've always lied to me. What? Do you want an apology? Scriabin asked. Edgar narrowed his eyes and assumed that Scriabin did the same, although he could not tell. What do you want me to say, Edgar? He pronounced his name in a strange way. If the narrative I constructed for you, as you put it, is wrong, then what is the correct one? What would you like me to act like? What do you want me to be? I don't want you at all. Edgar mashed his hate. Scriabin tore his hand from Edgar's grip, holding it to his chest as he rubbed it without thought. Scriabin's voice was quiet and emotionless. Then tell me, Edgar, what is it that you want? Not you. No, I'm being quite serious here, Edgar. Scriabin spoke as slowly as possible. What is it that you want? If what you said before is true, Scriven turned to one side and crossed his arms, mocking his previous tone. And after all, you've always lied to me. If that version of Johnny is not what you want, then what is it? Edgar crossed his arms and looked at his feet. Scriven leaned towards him, confident in having found a question that Edgar could not easily answer. He sneered at him. What is it you want, Edgar? If you don't want me, why did you make me? I didn't make you, Edgar gritted through clenched teeth. Of course you made me, but no. I'm curious. What is it that you want, Edgar? What is it? Because I'm looking back, rifling through all the old files and memories in your brain. And I'm looking for some goal. Some kind of thing to strive for. Something to keep living for. And what have I found? Edgar pressed a hand to his forehead. He knew that saying it out loud did as much good as saying it internally. So why waste the vocal power? I don't want to hear this. I don't want to hear this. I want you to die. I've found nothing, 
Edgar. Screaming had abandoned sarcasm, now nothing but vengeful hatred. I found absolutely nothing. You have no friends. You have no family. You have absolutely nothing. No one notices you. No one will ever notice you. You've accomplished nothing of any lasting importance in your entire life. You've never affected anyone for better or for worse. You wandered through life as a phantom, a pale imitation of what a person should be. You will be easily replaced because no one noticed you were there. Your life is nothing. Your entire life has just been a pantomime of what someone visible might act like, put on for an audience that will neither see or care. And when you die, Edgar, you will be alone. You will die completely and utterly alone, and it'll take two weeks for them to find your body. Edgar put his hands over his ears. And they won't waste time burying you. They won't waste the space that could be taken up by someone people would actually remember. Someone people actually care about. They won't give you a decent burial. They'll take you to a place where there's everlasting, ever-burning hellfire that consumes your flesh. And when you're ashes, they'll scatter you to the wind and no one will care. Edgar. No one will care. He was trying hard to block him out, but he could hear the voice inside his head. So tell me, Edgar, if you don't want a loving mutual relationship with someone who respects your opinions, who finds you strong and mature and a good person, if you don't want a supportive relationship with the one person in your life who actually sees you, then what do you want? What do you want from Johnny Edgar? Has this entire charade of a relationship just been an elaborate way of committing suicide without guessing your own blood on your hands? It's not the same. You're not Johnny. That wasn't him. You're so very astute. Screedman's voice dripped venom. But that's not my point, is it? My point is, is that what you want? My point, Edgar, is do you want to be happy? Do you want a happy, supportive relationship? I don't want to lie. Edgar glared at him, struggling to ignore the implications of what he was saying. I don't need a relationship, and I don't need you to pretend to give me one. I don't need you to lie to me. I have a relationship anyway. I have something that governs my whole life. Something that makes... Do you, Edgar? Think about it. It's one of the Ten Commandments, if I recall. Thou shalt not kill. I never killed anyone. But you wanted to. Scriabin stared at him as his voice mimicked Edgar's attempts to remove emotion. Do you remember... Those two teenagers in the movie theater, who, because they interrupted Johnny's precious sane time, made you want them tortured. You wanted them tortured, and you wanted to watch. I didn't. That was different. Do you know what their names were, Edgar? Were you paying attention? Did you recognize her before you died? That girl who escaped. That was her, Edgar. Did you notice she was alone? Have you thought about what that means? That means that the other boy she was with is gone now. He's dead. And to think, perhaps, you could have done something. You could have stopped someone's death. I would venture to say that is, if not exactly equal to, quite high on the thou shalt not kill meter of evil. What was I supposed to do? He had gone over this with Scraben before, he remembered. He remembered arguing and getting nowhere, before he even had a name. Could I have saved them? Did I have the power at that point to stop me from doing whatever he wanted? Did I? 
Why are you asking me? Scraven cocked his head at him. Why didn't you check? Because if you say it's because he would have killed you, I would have to disagree. If you feared death so much, you would not have gone this far. You would not have accepted the fact that Johnny plans to kill you, that he will kill you when he feels the time is right. You didn't want to stop Johnny because you wanted those two to suffer. I didn't. And in the end, one of them died. And that's one of the commandments. Which reminds me, I had almost forgotten about it before you thoughtfully mentioned it during the sparkly bubbles and rose petals. But I believe there's a verse in Leviticus. If a man also lie with mankind as he lieth with a woman, I don't... I don't do... I don't do things like that. I don't do that. Do what? Scraven smiled. Since I know as well as you do that you have not had any kind of contact with me that could even, at the most generous, resemble any kind of sex, then why such a reaction? Or do you interpret it a bit more vaguely? Apply it a bit further. I know, Edgar, that your version doesn't just end with lie with mankind as with a woman. That your concern and panic attack do not just apply to the non-sex you and me constantly have. No. You've expanded it, Edgar. To that word you avoid as though following that male stereotype I mentioned before. Altered the translation just slightly, but just enough. If a man also loveth a man as he loveth a woman... Or something along those lines. You're better at this Bible talk than I. Silence. Scriabin finally shook his head. It's the dreaded L word, Edgar. As much as it pains me to call it that. You didn't say a single word and you act as if that's all that matters. As if not saying that word negates everything. No, I don't. Not with... Not with anyone. Anyone except... Well, certainly not. You can't make me say that I do, no matter what you try. You can't make me say anything. Everything you make me say is a lie. Then what am I, Edgar? Scraben held out his arms. What does that make me? I don't know. I don't care. Edgar rubbed at his forehead as it began to throb. I just don't want to talk about this anymore. What is it that you want, Edgar? I wish I knew something. Anything. I don't want to die. I'd rather not die. Scraben laughed softly. If you don't want me, if you don't want Johnny, if you don't want happiness, if you don't want death, what is it? What is it that you want? Is it heaven? Because if it is, I'm afraid you're a little too dirty to go there now. No, I'm not. Here. Scraben waved his hands over himself again and took the form of Johnny without missing a beat. Edgar again felt the choking surprise and nausea that came with the imitation, but refused to show any such thing outwardly. Tell me, is this what you want? No. You do make this so difficult. Back to his sarcastic lilt again. He moved in front of Edgar making sure he had his attention. All right, then. How about this? And with the blink of an eye, Scriabin had become a woman, albeit a feminine version of Johnny, but nonetheless a woman. The hair remained the same length, but the body shape changed without any kind of effort. 
This would clear up that nasty Leviticus business, wouldn't it? No! Edgar closed his eyes in disgust, pressing on his forehead in an effort to get the pain to stop. He was trying very hard not to think about what he was offering. It doesn't change anything. That's not the issue. Oh? Then what is? Scriben reverted back to his original form. What is it? What is it that you want? Johnny to be sane. You said that once. You said you wanted Johnny to be happy. He did say that. Yes, but I didn't mean... What? Now you don't want Johnny to be happy? Isn't that why you invited him over? God, look. This is pointless. It's not important. I don't want to talk about it anymore. Or would you just prefer that Johnny be happy without your input? Without your sacrifice? Would you rather Johnny found happiness not with you, but with Devi? Edgar moved his hand so he could stare at Scriabin. I'm sorry. What? Scriabin smiled at him. An easy and simple question, my dear. Devi and Johnny, together, happy, fixed, married. As far along as the socially mandated measure of personal success as any two people can go. Isn't that what you want? That'd make you happy, wouldn't it? Would you mind picturing it for me? Just out of curiosity, of course. I'm sure such a thing wouldn't bother you, considering what you've said so far. It... Edgar searched his feelings for the clear and simple answer that he knew he had, and strangely couldn't find it. He'd never really considered Johnny restarting a relationship with Devi, considering how disastrously it had ended last time, and... <laughs> I heard that, Scriabin left. You tried to cut it off, but yes, I can hear everything you know. You thought you were important to him. Is that what you wanted, Edgar? Is that it? You wanted to make a difference? No. I guess that's the wish of every invisible man. You wanted to fix him, didn't you? Did you want to make him happy, Edgar? That's what you said, isn't it? That's not what I meant, so you'll only go so far, then. How important is Johnny's happiness to you, in the long run? I recall before that you put it ahead of your own, because his are more rare, it was more valid, and if I recall, there was some mention of how Johnny really feels things, rather than pretend like some people I could mention. I didn't mean- Tell me, Edgar. Scriven waited for a moment as if giving Edgar room to defend himself. Silence. You were willing to give your own life for Johnny's happiness earlier. He said he would kill you, and you said you would understand. Isn't that the ultimate sacrifice that a person could make? So why is it so abhorrent to you to allow him to love you? Because he doesn't. That's why. Well, let's play along then and just say that I'm mistaken. <laughs> I'm sure that can happen. His tone clearly indicated he thought no such thing. But play pretend with me here. What if, to make Johnny truly happy, Edgar, he had to love you? What if that fixed him? What if the heavens opened, the earth sang, and little woodland creatures came and frolicked around him because, hallelujah, the love of a good man is all a person needs these days to cure schizophrenia? What would you do, Edgar? I mean, I ask you this in all honesty. If it made him happy, how far would you go? It's not a relevant question, because he doesn't love me. 
Edgar refused to even consider the possibility. He's... Well, his understanding of love isn't like other people's. It's different. And whatever it is, he doesn't love me. He can't. I've done... Oh, you've done plenty for him, I'm afraid. And the real irony is, it's all because you've done nothing. He vents, you listen, and you do what he wants. You're the one thing in his life that he can control. I'm afraid you do a lot more for him than you know. You give him stability. You gave him a coat. Regardless, I hardly think, well, how would you define that love then? He did seem rather pleased to see you near the end, despite his screaming fit beforehand. What is Johnny's love, Edgar? I think we know the answer from Devi. It's death. And what has he promised to do to you? He promised to kill you. That's not... the same. It's something entirely different in that case. No, it isn't. Scraben's tone made Edgar fall silent. He wanted you to be perfect and beautiful, just like the others. He wanted you to be perfect and beautiful, like Devi never was. He loved the other so much, and they loved him back, perfectly and beautifully. And Edgar, he wants to love you the same way. He wants to love you and have you love him back, perfectly and beautifully. That is precisely what he said, in words and in print. The question is, what are you going to do about it? That's not the same thing. He wanted me as a friend. I know he must have just wanted a perfect friend, not a... Edgar trailed off at Scriabin's expression. It is the same. Edgar closed his eyes. He just doesn't. We can argue in circles all we like, but there's no point. I don't know what you want me to do. What do you want to accomplish? Me? Scriabin put a hand on his chest as if offended. I've been trying to keep you alive, you twit. I've been trying to make you grow a spine and realize that this isn't healthy. Edgar held out his arms wide and stared at him. Why do you care? Scriabin opened his mouth as if to say something, then ended up saying nothing at all. I want to wake up. As if Edgar's speech had jarred him back into motion, Scriabin spoke without pause. Well, obviously because I want you to become sane, which has an added benefit of keeping you alive. Edgar gave him an odd look. Why did you hesitate? If it was obvious. Scriabin suddenly became very interested in the white around him, turning away from Edgar and putting his hands in his pockets. I wouldn't call that hesitation exactly. It was just a question with such an obvious answer that I was surprised you'd even ask. I reside in your mind. It's in my best interests to keep you alive. You're keeping something from me, aren't you? Scriabin turned back towards him with a very monotone, Duh. Edgar put a hand to his forehead. If you're a voice in my head and I created you, if I provide the place where you live, then why don't I have any control over you? <laughs> Scriabin began laughing rather hard at that. It's not funny. Scriabin tried to catch his breath. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. It's just this is coming from a guy who was in psychosexual bondage a few minutes ago. Edgar glared at him. That wasn't my fault. Scriabin held out his hands dramatically. Yes, I tied you up because I'm a sick pervert. That's right. Edgar sighed and rubbed at his forehead. His head throbbed. <sighs> Hasn't this been enough already? How much longer do we have to keep talking? We aren't even accomplishing anything. 
We're just wasting time. Scriven turned away from him, looking upwards at the sky, or ceiling, or nothing again. His hands were behind his back, and Edgar could see that they were tightly clasped, a little too much so. Under some circumstances, that is accomplishing something, he said quietly. It took Edgar a second to realise that Scriabin had been talking to himself. It was so against his nature that he didn't even think Scriabin was capable of it. What are we really doing here? Edgar squinted at him. You don't really care about what I feel for Nee, or how I feel about myself, or the situation I'm in, or what sins I'm responsible for. You just want to keep me talking, and you're looking for any way to do it. Why is that? Edgar paused, following the train of thought. The only reasons you do anything are either to benefit yourself or avoid some negative consequence. So which is it? You're not really one to tell me what I do or don't care about. Scriven was still looking up, still held his hands tightly. He sounded vaguely distracted. You're hiding something. I know you are, and I know you're not going to tell me what it is if I ask. You said there wasn't anything else to do here, and you have the power to create things. You could make something else to do here if you wanted, but you wanted me to focus on you. You wanted me to keep talking to you. Edgar paused with a tilt of his head. Are you afraid of what will happen if we stop? Scriabin twitched, his shoulders up and he turned back around to face him. Sudden tension ran through him, his voice strained with sounding nonchalant. Afraid? Me? Of what? Being bored to death in the nothing you've provided me? You're the one who orchestrated this entire scenario, apparently just to have me call you a bad boy so you can play the martyr and feel better about yourself. You are afraid. He could see it and the moment of offended sputtering from him confirmed it. What could you be afraid of? What would make you need my attention that badly? And anger bled through Scriabin's offence. You think I want your attention? How desperate for validation are you? And you were accusing me of creating false scenarios to force my chosen interpretations of events. Edgar pressed a hand to his mouth in thought pointedly ignoring him which he knew would make him angrier. A small recompense for what Scriabin had put him through, but he'd take it. You lie to me about being dead. You claim to have paused me in the process of dying. You create an empty world where all I can do is talk to you, which you try to keep going as long as possible. You're delaying something. Something bad. Something bad for you. And you need me to keep it from happening. You have no idea what you're talking about. I know you're not going to tell me the truth, so can you give me any other explanation? Evidence is working against you here, Scriabin. I... Scriabin pointed at him, then stopped abruptly. A faint shiver went through him. He looked up again at the sky, or where it would have been and turned his head this way and that as if searching for something up there. His brow furrowed. He frowned with something that might have been concern. I... It was tempting to keep pressing him, but the look on his face made Edgar worried. Scriabin didn't look concerned. Not like that. Edgar looked up himself, trying to find what Scriabin had been looking at or searching for, but there was just the same nothing as there always had been. Edgar got a strange feeling, an odd lightness on his feet, some kind of internal tangle and working. Scriabin kept looking at nothing for nothing. His hands were shaking, and he made an unhappy humming sound. He shook his head, then angled away from Edgar, waving a hand at him with the same forced nonchalance. Of course. As you always do whenever you're losing an argument, you're running away from me. You really are such a coward. I'm running away. Edgar gave him a look. I'm not even moving. 
Well, clearly something's happening, Edgar. Scrooben held out a hand, which looked, strangely, a little translucent. I'm not doing it, so there's only one other option. And you can't even admit that you're running away. Even to the end, you're disappointing. I'm not. Edgar held out his arms. I'm not doing anything. You're the one who's disappearing. No thanks to you. Screeben's annoyance felt forced, and Edgar could see a tremble running across his shoulders now as well. He pointed at him, and there was something too intense about his voice, a ragged edge to it that made Edgar very uncomfortable. Remember, Edgar, you can't get rid of me that easily. I'll always be with you, no matter how far you try to run. I'm not going anywhere. Nothing is going to take me away from you. Edgar blinked at him, that discomfort shifting over to an anxious concern he didn't want to have, considering who he was talking to. Take you away from me? Who could? Screeben looked up again in a movement too jerky and quick, then turned away from him with a dismissive wave of his hand. It's all a dream, right? Isn't that what you said? If you're going to be such a baby about talking to me, then I'll see you when you wake up. Screeben. Edgar found himself moving towards him, reaching out a hand to him in spite of himself. He was still fading. Something was wrong. He was sure of it. That strange light feeling hadn't gone away either. It grew as Screeben seemed to get weaker. <sighs> so needy. Screeben's voice was shaking. It was faint. You don't get lonely, remember. You're fine all by yourself. A moment, and he was almost gone. I'm fine. All by myself. By the time he was close enough to him, Screeben had faded away into nothing. And just like that, he couldn't hear him anymore.